All right. Good morning. Give me a wave if you can hear what I'm saying and everything's looking good. All right. Thumbs up. Right now, I'm looking at the number. There's 153 people watching today. Whoa, let's do this. All right. My name's Mr. Angel from the History Colorado Museum. Here's what we got going. Always tune in, 10 o'clock Thursday morning. Spread the word with all your friends and everything. This is going to be like school only better. Let's do this. All right, here's what we got going. Today's topic, part of what I'm doing, I always got my campfire stories hat on, stories about Colorado, the wonderful state that we live in. And what we've chosen so far, this is the fifth week we've been doing this. So far, I got my little list here. We started off with doing El Vaquero, the first cowboy taught everyone how to make a rope and how to twirl a rope. Then we did the Tommy Knockers, all about the little spirits that live in the mines. Then we did Bent's Fort. Then last week we did all about Pike's Peak because I thought it was interesting. People know about Pike's Peak, but not really. So we learned a lot about Pike's Peak. And today's topic is boom, look at this wild guy. Got a wild, crazy beard, got a fox on top of his head, got some, uh, his clothes are made out of deer skin. He's got some Native American India paraphernalia on him. He's clearly out in the woods and he's clearly up in the mountains of Colorado. So today's topic is gonna to be the mountain man. Now, these are pretty short classes actually, so hang in there with me or I talk fast. I have so many items to show you today. It's gonna to be an immense show and tell. And at the end, we're gonna finish up with a fantastic little uh, rifle that I need to show you about. Now, what we have planned for the following weeks are more very, very interesting topics about the state that we live in. So let's get started with this guy right here. I love it when I move over like this, it kind of looks like I have the little fox on top of my head there, just like that. Now, when we think about the mountain man, I want to do a little quick timeline to, so we understand when did this guy actually happen? So I got this here, but as the marker, I'm going to use this. Now this is the state flag of Colorado, of course, that's what it looks like. The blue is for the sky, the white is for the snow, the yellow is for the sun, and the sea is for Colorado, of course. There's a reason that the sea is red, and I'm going to talk about that two weeks from now when I talk about the Spanish explorers. Now, timeline. We became a state in 1876. And I know when on Zoom, all the letters are all weird and everything, but 18, maybe I'll do it like this. Yeah, that's better. 1876, which is that better or that? Okay, well, 1876, we become a state. But the years of the mountain man are this, 1820 to 1840. Now, what you need to know about time is we're in 2020. So 1920 would have been 100 years ago. 1820 would have been 200 years ago. So I'm talking about a time frame that happened two centuries ago. Now, the whole reason for this guy, and I got some other pictures for him too. These are kind of drawings, but this is what they look like. They wore animal clothes, and the reason is they didn't have Walmart, they didn't have Target, they didn't have Amazon.com. They had to make their own clothes by killing animals. Most of the time they wore deer skin because it's very comfortable, it's very durable. I have a whole deer skin outfit that I wear myself with my mountain man character. And then as you can see, this guy's killed a big animal down there, right? So they were hunters and they were explorers. They were the first major explorers of the Rocky Mountain West. So here we got another guy there, dressed very similar to this guy right here. And then you can't talk about the mountain men without talking about Native Americans because they coexisted at a time when the Native American nations were dominant in the West and the mountain men were the first white people that started coming into the West. But when they were out there like this, as you can see, the mountain, co the mountain men coexisted along with the Native Americans 200 years ago here in Colorado. Now the reason the mountain men were here is this little brown furry guy right there. <laughs> look at that guy, tiny, tiny, look at his feet. If you look at the feet, they got the big tail, 
But if you look at the feet, the feet are kind of like duck's feet. And the reason is they're webbed feet because they swim under the water. People don't realize that beavers have webbed feet along with that big tail to help them navigate. So the whole reason for the mountain man was this little guy, the beaver here, because people wanted to have beaver skin hats over in Europe because they're soft, they're nice and everything. And what they're looking for, of course, and when we did Baines Ford, I showed this also, but I wanted to show it to you again. Now, if you can kind of see it in the light, it's just beautiful, the sheen of it, the color of it. This is real beaver skin. The fur on one side, and on the other side you have the hide, of course. But this is what it was all about, to get this hide to package up, probably send to Ben's Fort was one of the places, send over to Europe so people could wear a hat made out of this beaver pelt right here. So then what happens is, there's always this question, well, who are the famous uh, mountain men, okay? I want to introduce you to uh, four of them, I think. And if you get interested in these topics I talk about every Thursday, I do a very quick run through of them almost to, uh, to stimulate your imagination. And of course, you can go on the internet because you're at home doing your own self-schooling a lot nowadays. Learn more about the topic on your own. I'm just introducing some of this to you. One of the main people you're going to hear about as a mountain man was Kit Carson. Now, Kit Carson, these are pictures of him looking like this, but this is how he looked when he went to work as a mountain man. Later on, he'd go into the studio, put on these fancy clothes, and look how stern he looked, right? Kit Carson, he was a very famous hunter. He was a mountain man. He was an Indian agent. Uh, had a huge role in the founding of the opening up of the West. And then so Kit Carson is one of them. Another one of them is a guy here. You got to go to Jim Bridger, right? Got to go to Jim Bridger. You got Kit Carson. You got Jim Bridger right there. But you can't talk about the mountain men without talking about this guy, James Beckworth. Okay. He was a slave out in Virginia. And then he got freed. And he came out west. And then he had a great life. Uh, he traded on the Santa Fe Trail. He lived with the Crow Indians. He was adopted in the Crow Nation. He became a Crow. He was called a Black Crow Chief for a long time. Uh, so he got freed from slavery, came out west, became a mountain man. I find Jim Beckworth to be one of the most interesting of all the mountain men. I do have a favorite mountain man, though. My favorite mountain man is this guy, Mariano Medina. I've actually done a whole hour and a half show about him dressed as him. He's a fascinating character. And so Mountain Mariano Medina is my, my personal favorite mountain man. My second personal favorite mountain man, of course, would be Jim Beckworth. So if you want to find more about somebody, check out Jim Beckworth. Check out Mariano Medina. People like Jim Bridger and Kit uh, Carson, there's so much written about them, you can find them pretty easy, but it's always more interesting to find the characters that you don't hear a lot about because their lives just as great as those other famous guys. Okay, now we gotta talk about the mountain men and how they live their life and what they use to live their life. I already told you, they dress like this, their skin clothes. Let me just show you some of the things that they would use in their life. One of the things is a bag like this, just a little bag. Nowadays, we call it a man purse, right? And inside, there'd be stuff. But what this is, it's called, it's got a cute nickname. It's called a possible's bag. And the reason is it got that nickname. You would have things inside of it that you possibly might need. So inside here would be your possible's bag. So every mountain man had a possible's bag like this. Every mountain man had a knife like this. Now this isn't the old knife. This is a real bad boy, right? It's called a Ben's Fort knife, actually. It's got a brass handle on it, a brass uh, wire on it, uh, oak handle. But look how big that blade is. The reason you needed a blade like this, don't forget, you're skinning animals all the time, right? Taking the skin off of animals. So you can't use a knife like this, you need a really, a, a weak knife, you need a powerful knife. So in, uh, and this wouldn't be in their possibles bag, this would be on their belt like this. So you had to have your knife like this. Then you had to have, <laughs> it's kind of funny, you had to have your pipe. Because another thing that was in your possibles bag, 
this is something I made myself. It's some leather, some deer skin leather, and I treated it and I stored it up like this. And inside here, with this little wooden plug, is some tobacco. And I love the smell of it. It's kind of like a cherry tobacco. So they'd also have in their bag, they'd have their little pouch made of leather with tobacco in it. And then they had their pipe. Now, if you look at this pipe real closely, it's clearly hand carved and made out of wood. They couldn't go to the store and buy a pipe. They had to get a piece of wood, carve it out, hollow it out like that, kill an animal, get the skin, get some tobacco somehow. If they didn't get tobacco, they'd use bark of a tree to smoke, and then they'd have their pipe, and they'd be there like this all the time, like this, right? So they had that. Then the other thing they had, well, they had to have your water canteen, right? So you water, and it is made of wood, okay? They made of wood. Again, it's got a wooden plug on the top of it like this. And what's cool about this water canteen is, now I want you to think about water in a wooden canteen. The problem with it, the water leaks out. So you get, it's called pitch. You get tree sap and you melt it over the fire in a little, you know, your little pan. And when it's all liquid, you pour it inside and you swish it around like this. And when it dries, it dries hard and it seals the inside of your wooden container. So this is just some wood. They made this themselves, right? So they had to have a container to carry water around, and this would have been their canteen. But it's just made out of wood. It's something they just carried around with themselves like that. So the other thing they had, this, hold on a second. This is one of my favorite items. I always wear it like this when I'm doing my mountain man thing. Let me do it like this, put it on. You can see how it works. Oh, it's stuck on my glasses. Things always get crazy. Hold on a second. There we go. Get this going like that. Got that there. Got my hat back on. This is my neck knife. I love my neck knife. And the reason I love it, I always got it here. So I have got my big knife for carving animals. I got my neck knife for the small stuff. Now, if you look at it like this, this is elk antler this is bone it's really cool and this isn't a metal blade like the other knife this is flint the characteristic of flint sharp is a razor blade so on my neck knife had a little knife made out of elk bone and then here i had my flint knife and then i'd wear it just like this i stand up so you can see it wear it around my neck just like this so it's always there ready to go if I needed to do some small work, if I needed to do my big work, I had my big work. Now, something else, I got my ax, right? Now, I buy, you might be wondering, why does he have all these sharp weapons, if you want to look at it like that? You got to remember what this guy's job was. This guy here and those people I showed you, they lived outdoors. They were hunters. That's what they were. They were hunters. Their job was to go out, find animals, kill them, sell the meat, trade the meat, trade the skins. That was their job. And these are just, they're not weapons. You, you got to put your mindset in a different place. Everything I've shows you for is, is not a weapon. It's a tool for them to do their work. The other tool that they need, they yeah, showed this in Ben's Ford, actually. They need this big rock, right? Now listen to it. Kind of sounds like glass, right? It's not any old rock, it's flint. Now, if you look at it, it's flint is really pretty. It kind of looks like petrified wood. But again, you can make this right here, your little knife out of it, or what you can do is you can make chunks out of it. And if you get your small chunks like this, and you get your steel, flint and steel, those of you that play Minecraft, you know, that if you strike it like this, you get a spark, and that's the beginning of your fire. And then you always have in your possibles bag, you have your flint, you have your steel, you have your tobacco, you have your pipe, and you have your tin. And in here, it'd be like some hemp, some little string or a char cloth. And that's things you might possibly need when you're out there just to live 
and to do your work. Now I want to show you another rock. This rock's my favorite rock. You see how shiny it is? It's called obsidian. And it's a lot like flint in the sense that if you strike it, you're going to get a spark and help you start a fire. So you're either going to be using flint or you're going to be using this. Now they had something else around their neck. They had this little bag and inside this bag might be something special what they might need. So as you see, they're all covered up. Now the reason they have a lot of Native American stuff, they didn't wear moccasins like this. The Native Americans would wear this, but you can tell this has the same beadwork this guy has around his neck there. Remember I told you the, the mountain men, you have to put them at the same time period when the Native Americans ruled the West. Later on in a few years, they'd have a lot of struggles and would lose a lot of their territories. But 200 years ago, during the time of this man, the Native Americans were living the fullness of their life when we think about them. Now what the mountain man would wear, he'd wear shoes like this. These are the shoes I wear. Deer skin on the top, and this is buffalo hide on the bottom. They're so comfortable, but remember, they didn't wear boots or like you might think cowboy boots or military boots. They wore boots, headpieces, clothing made out of the animals that they killed because that's the only place they could get anything to wear while they were doing their work. So they'd wear moccasins like this, not Native American moccasins like this because these are too fine with the beadwork. The beadwork they wore around their neck, but they'd have this like this. Now, the last thing I want to show you a little bit about, so far I've told you about the time period 200 years ago coexisted with the Native Americans equally. Also, who some of the famous uh, Native, uh, mountain men were, Jim Beckworth, Mariana Medina, Jim Bridger, and uh, Kit Carson. Now, told you what they wore, what they carried in their possible bags, what the tools were that they needed to do their work. This is something else they always had with them. And I showed you this in bench four. So remember this bison horn? This is what it looks like when it's raw, right off the animal, all beat up and kind of rough. But if you make it into the tool that you need, it turns out like this. This is a gunpowder holder. Everything's got wood, right? It's got a wood plug on it. This also is elk antler. You can see the roughness of the ridge on it there and everything. And then you put this here. The reason they needed this is for the last tool I'm gonna to show you today. This bad boy right here, my friend Katie is listening. Katie, thank you. You can tell I use this all the time. <laughs> all right, this bad boy right here is the flint rifle. What you don't see in the picture here is him. They didn't go anywhere without this. They needed this, just like they needed everything else. I want to show you how cool this is and how it works. What happens is you don't put a bullet in it. What you do is, in your possibles bag, or around you, I'll have this other bag. And in the bag would be a couple of things. There would be a little patch like this. It's a little piece of cloth. Usually it's a piece of shirt if you want to think about it like that. Then they'd have this, a small lead ball is what they would have. And what they would do is you get the rifle like this and with your powder horn, first you put a little bit of powder, just the right amount, and your little antler horn like this. And you plug it back up. Then put the powder down there like that, right? Just like that. Now it's all good. Then you get your patch. Then you get your ball. Then you take this out, right? You got to tap it down like that. And what you do, you tap it to you get a little bounce like that. Now you got the powder in there. You got the patch. You got the ball. And you tap it like that, okay? Tap it all down, take your rod out like that. Put the rod back away because the rod lives with the gun. Then all the action happens here. 
Now this particular rifle, see this little container here? It's super cool. It's a door that opens up. And inside would be things that you need. Inside here would be some patches and a little piece of flint, right? Now remember the idea of flint causing a spark? This is a flint lock rifle is what it's called. And you carry your essentials in the little container there. Then here's where all the action happens. I'm actually gonna show up and show you how it works like this. All the action happens right here. It's got two triggers. And what you do is you pull this back like this. And you see right here, there's a little piece of flint. And right here is a little bowl, like a dish, and a little lever here. You put a little bit of gunpowder right in there. And that hole, when you spark it, it causes a spark to go inside the barrel, ignites the gunpowder you've already put in the barrel, shoots the little ball out. And then you close this. Now, you pull this back all the way, like that. Then, you set it with the front one, get it ready. Now get ready, you might be able to see a spark, I hope you can. Pull this down. You guys see that spark? Let me see if I can do it again for you, okay? Get it ready like that. When you get it set with the first one, back, the back one sets it, it's called a hair trigger, and then you spark it like this, and we'll put it nice and close here. You see a little bitty spark, and that is how this, it's called a black powder rifle. It's called a flintlock rifle because right here is a piece of flint that causes the spark when it hits this lever, causes this gunpowder to go in that little bitty hole there, a flame lights the whole thing, shoots it. So this rifle is a really accurate rifle of what it was like when the mountain men were doing their work out west. Okay, we've been talking pretty hard now for almost 30 minutes about the mountain men, who they were, 200 years ago, Native Americans with their names, the objects they used to do their work. They weren't weapons, they were tools in order to do their work, collecting the skins of animals to trade at a post like Ben's Fort, right? All right, so that's about it for the Mountain Man. I hope you enjoyed it. We ended up with 165 people listening. Rock on, looking good. Tell your friends to always check in Thursday morning. Next week, See that big mountain in the back there? I'm going to tell a story about a person climbed up there 150 years ago, one of the first people to climb to the peak of Long's Peak. So we'll be talking about uh, another great explorer and famous person in Colorado history next week. All right, let's open this up, Miss Josie, for questions and answers. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Angel. We've got a number of questions today, and we want to keep... Uh, track of everybody's time here, but we do have some really awesome questions. Um, sure. First question that we had is, how did people know, how did our mountain men know which food was safe to eat? You know what I love about these questions? They're coming out of curiosity. That's the thing I love best about knowledge and the thing I love best about being a student or being a teacher, curiosity. Because then when you follow the line of curiosity, you're going to discover information. Now, I'll be honest with you about the lives of the mountain men back there and what they knew was safe to eat. It was a very dangerous lifestyle. And the reason is, one, you could be eaten by a bear, right? You could be trampled by a moose. You could be attacked by an elk. You could be attacked from someone, a dangerous person out there in the mountains. It was dangerous for you personally. You're living outside all the time. There were bugs and snakes and spiders. At any given time, something could happen to you. On top of that, you had to find your own food. It's not like they had a store. It's like they might take dried food with them or something. But basically, when you're out there for months at a time, you had to find your own food on top of everything else. So not only are you a hunter, you're like a forager. Kill an animal, looking for plants to eat, looking for berries to eat or you'd starve to death, or it'd be winter time, right? So the idea, the animals that they would eat, they'd eat bison, they'd eat elk, and they'd eat deer, 
Maybe they'd eat beaver, you know, maybe they'd eat small game, things that they would find out there. So the idea of what was safe to eat wasn't that much of an idea at this time. They'd eat whatever they could find because they knew the other choice was to starve to death. So a lot of time, of course, you might eat something that was infected, something that had been something that a, a parasite might have been in it. You might have gotten something inside of yourself from the food that you were eating. So the idea of how did they know what to eat, you got to understand these were very experienced people. They were out there for years at a time doing this work. They knew what they were doing. The Native Americans, they learned from the Native Americans about what food, what plants were safe to eat, what were the seasons to go hunting for different animals. The knowledge that they had about living outdoors is a knowledge we don't have anymore because we go to King Supers. I don't have to worry about that, right? So their knowledge was deep by experience and shared knowledge among themselves. Don't forget they coexisted with the Native Americans that had lived there for thousands of years. And the Native Americans could share with them information about what was safe to eat. It was important to know, you had to learn or else your life would be in danger. Fabulous question. Well, our other question is gonna be kind of the two part question is, what season of the year did mountain men hunt beavers? And then how did they know when the rivers would have fish in it? <laughs> the rivers always have fish in it. That's a problem. <laughs> These questions crack me up. The fish don't leave the rivers, okay? The fish live in the rivers. The beavers live in the rivers. So all year long, the animals are there. Your question is, can you survive in wintertime? It's going to be too cold. Can you get there? Because some of these mountain passes were so covered with snow, couldn't get there. Once the beaver trade was over around the, in the 1940s, all these mountain men got jobs as Indian scouts, they got jobs as wagon scouts, helping people get across, especially on the Oregon Trail or the Mormon Trail, how to get through the Rocky Mountains, because the mountain men had been doing this for 20, 30 years, knew where all the paths were, knew when the right season was. The Native Americans and the mountain men would tell these wagon people, don't even start now, you get up there, you're going to die because you're going to be frozen to death. So they had to know the seasons. They had to know the paths. They also needed to know when the rivers would be frozen, right? And you couldn't get to the animals and what the seasons were. Generally, summertime is a great time to be in there. You're not freezing to death. The animals are all out. The rivers are flowing. You can see all the fish and beaver out there like that. Wintertime, very severe dangerous time to be out. So the idea about when they would go out, it's seasonal. They, they were called seasonal migrations and they were seasonal migrations depending upon if the weather was right, if the passes were open, if the rivers were flowing, and don't forget if there was food available, meaning animals or plants growing in better seasons. So always think about the seasons and what might be a better time to go out hunting very similar to us. You don't want to be up there in the dead of winter. It's going to be very, very dangerous for you. Okay, good. Next question. We're going to do two more questions. All right. This next one is, could women be mountain men? You know what? The question of women in the West is something that I have to answer quite a bit because in the work that I've done studying out the, the history and um, who was living out west at this time, who came out, why they came out, both the cowboy west, the mountain man west, the, we the wagons coming across in the Oregon Trail or the, or the mountain trail. The big answer is, of course, there are women out here all the time. You know, there are families out here. The Native American populations were full families. You know, they were tribal families. There are women, there are children, multi-generational groupings and everything. So there were women out in the west all the time doing the work of ranchers, doing the work of cowboys, doing the work of explorers. One of the problems you don't read about women very much, all the stories are written about the men, right? So the stories are written about the men, the men are writing stories about other men. Women are kind of erased in history. And then so the Colorado History of the Bayer Evans uh, Museum, one of the branch museums of the History of Colorado Museum, it's dedicated to the history of women in the West. Now, the particular answer, were the women like this? Not very many that we know about. That's the thing. 
One of the women I'm going to talk about later on is a woman named Isabella Bird. She was an explorer that came out here. She wrote diaries about herself. And only now, 150 years later, people are saying, oh my gosh, there are actually women out here being explorers. But they were erased and forgotten by history. And our job as scholars, students, and historians is to bring their stories back to the front. So that's what we're trying to do. But the other answer to that is mountain men, no. Call mountain men for a reason. Only men went out and did this job. Women didn't go do this job. Okay, thanks, Angel. One more question for you, and that is, where did the mountain men get their guns? Whoa, great question. <laughs> okay. uh, I actually have, where would that, where'd that bad boy go? I actually have two of these guns. This is one of them because it's a flintlock gun and the other one's called a percussion cap gun that has a different firing mechanism here like this. Where they got their guns, they got them wherever they could find them is the, is the smart alecky answer, right? They traded for them at post. Every year they'd have a rendezvous where all the trappers up to 500 would come together and they trade, they tell stories. Native Americans would be there. They trade out for their guns. Some of the great suppliers of uh, these guns came out of St. Louis, actually, right? They're called Hawken Rifles. The two brothers, the Hawken brothers, made these rifles, the Hawken Rifle. And the Hawken Rifle was the number one rifle that mountain men wanted to have. There's a lot of different rifles during this time period, but the Hawken Rifle by the Hawken brothers out of St. Louis, that was the rifle to have. And all the mountain men, if they could get it, trade for it, afford it, buy it, the Hawken rifle is, was considered the rifle of the mountain men. All right. Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much, Angel. I really appreciate you this morning.